good morning to those on the West Coast, afternoon to everyone else. <clears throat> Thank you, Gilbert, for having Volition Rx back again. We're pleased to be presenting again at the GCFF conference. <clears throat> I know many of you have probably been following the Volition story for some time. And thank you for those who have been um, watching our progress. Allow me to just share my screen and bring up the presentation. Hopefully all of you can see the PowerPoint presentation. As Gilbert mentioned, our company is called Volition RX Limited. Ticker is VNRX on the NYSE American Stock Exchange. Um, point you to our forward-looking statements and disclaimer. As Gilbert mentioned, Volition RX is a diagnostics company. We're working principally in blood-based diagnostics, and a lot of our work has been in oncology, so looking at uh, developing blood tests to screen for different cancers in both humans and in animals. And we do have some other programs, but I'll focus principally on our oncology programs. Um, modality is very important. Blood is a very convenient modality through which to screen people for various diseases. Um, blood is a bodily fluid that most of us give freely and regularly. Most of us have had numerous blood tests over the course of our lives. Um, it, it may surprise some of you to know that, that really we don't use blood testing to screen for very many cancer types. Um, the only, really the only cancer type that we screen using blood for any, uh, is, is prostate cancer. Uh, that's the PSA test for prostate cancer in men. We really don't use any other blood test as a frontline screen to screen for, uh, for various cancer types. We use x-rays, we use uh, CAT scans, we use um, biopsies, we use colonoscopies, mammographies, and so forth. And uh, those suffer from a number of limitations. Um, those tests can be very expensive. Those tests can be uh, not very accurate in the early stage. Some of these tests can be harmful to patients. And some of these tests suffer from compliance problems, which means people just don't comply with their screening obligations and get screened for these various cancer types because of the expense, the unpleasantness, and potential harm uh, of actually going for one of these diagnostic tests. Working in blood, we don't suffer from the same limitations. Right? We can't harm someone by analyzing blood that's been taken from, uh, from their vein. Um, we just need to show strong accuracy um, that we are able to uh, show strong performance, that is a low false negative rate and or a low false positive rate. And as Gilbert mentioned, we're working in both human health and in animal health. And uh, in fact, we, we became a commercial stage company last year. At the end of November, we launched our first product, which is a blood test to screen for two very common cancer types in canines. And you can see here, it's called the NUQ Vet Cancer screening test. And you can see some of the statistics here on your screen. There are uh, approximately 77 million canines in the U.S. alone. You can see that there are about 20 million of those canines aged seven and older. 83% of canines visit a vet at least once per year. Uh, so it's a significant market opportunity for us. You can see 6 million cancer diagnoses in the U.S. alone which is more than 3.5 times the number of human cancer diagnoses. So a large opportunity. You can see from your screen here, some of our clinical data. Uh, we have very strong performance in detecting these two common canine cancers. And um, the results were so good that we jointly launched our product with Texas A&M University. And it is currently for sale through Texas A&M University on their uh, gastroenterology website. The studies were run at Texas A&M University over the course of um, 2019 and 2020. And you can see the results here for canine lymphoma. We had 74% sensitivity, which means we accurately identified about three quarters of all canines that had lymphoma in the study and uh, with 0% false positives, so no false positives. That's the 100% specificity number. 
And then you can see on the right for hemangiosarcoma, we accurately identified 89%. So almost nine out of 10 canines with hemangiosarcoma with no false positives, 100% specificity. So very strong results uh, here with Texas A&M. We launched the product exclusively through their GI lab in November of last year. And you can see from this, uh, from this uh, slide here, how we're positioning the test. It can be positioned at least initially in, in two ways. One would be as a symptomatic uh, check or a symptomatic screen. So vets tell us they have a very hard time differentiating between cancer, inflammation, and infection. So your, your dog may be sick for weeks or months and you might take it to the vet. The vet often has a hard time diagnosing what's causing the symptoms. And because at least in the United States, um, we generally do not have pet insurance to cover the cost of veterinary visits for our, our dogs. It's largely out of pocket. So it's, it's cash payments that we're making on behalf of our canine to the, vet, to the veterinary clinic. And because of that, the vets can be very reluctant to order, at least at the first visit, a lot of very expensive invasive diagnostic tests to find out what's wrong with the canine. So the, the vets currently do not have a tool like the volition blood test that they could run, say at the first visit when the canine is sick and the test could be administered in a symptomatic setting to rule in or rule out cancer. So if cancer is ruled out, that's obviously the most serious of the three conditions. Um, then the pet can be given anti-inflammatory pills um, or anti antibiotics to help with an infection or inflammation. Um, if it does come back as cancer, uh, then it's obviously a more serious condition that the canine has. And, uh, but it's important to know that just because just like with, with humans, it's important to know as early as possible that you have a particular cancer type because um, if you can identify cancer at the early stage uh, in canines, just like in humans, you'll improve outcomes and save lives. So really important, obviously, um, tool that, that we uh, are now offering to veterinarians. The other way it can be positioned is as you can see at the top would be an annual wellness check. Um, if you look at the, if you remember the slide, um, two slides previous, there are about 20 million canines in the US age seven and older. Uh, age seven is the age at which uh, canines in aggregate are much more likely to develop cancer than under age seven. So um, just like we position some tests for cancer types in humans uh, to screen based upon turning a certain age, for instance, in the United States, when a man or a woman turns age 45, if they uh, are asymptomatic, they're supposed to still get screened for colorectal cancer through a colonoscopy at age 45. Men age 50 is the first time they're supposed to take the PSA test unless they have symptoms or a family history of prostate cancer. So this test could be positioned for canines upon turning age seven as a wellness check. And again, um, this would be asymptomatic canines just to check say once a year, maybe twice a year to see and if the test comes back for cancer, again, it's probably an early stage cancer because the canine is still asymptomatic. Um, the cancer can often be treated, can be stopped from metastasizing to other organs. The canine's life can be potentially saved. Life expectancy can be extended uh, because the cancer is caught at an earlier stage. Our pricing, we are, our cost of goods is under $5. We sell to Texas A&M for $45 US. They then resell to veterinarians for 122 and the vets sell to the general public for around the $200 mark. So you, you can do the math. If we sell 100,000 tests per year, it's four and a half million top line revenue to Volition. If we sell a million tests per year, it's 45 million in top line revenue for Volition. So we're really excited about the veterinary opportunity. Again, if we look at this slide, you can see that the cancers we're detecting, lymphoma and mangiosarcoma are bloodborne cancers. And while we were getting good results in canines, we decided to look at human health. And you can see from this slide here, uh, we're looking at a number of um, uh, substrates of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, acute myeloid leukemia, and a couple other subtypes of, uh, of lymphoma and leukemia. And you can see on this slide, um, it's in red at the bottom center of your screen, we had an area under the curve um, in a small study, 54 subjects of 91%. So again, demonstrating really strong accuracy in a small study 
also looking at bloodborne cancers in humans. So really encouraged by these results. We've announced publicly we're launching uh, a, a, a large study in the U.S. Um, to look at a number of lymphomas and leukemias. So we'll have additional news uh, over the course of this year. And then our other oncology programs in human health uh, have been in colorectal and lung cancer historically. Uh, with colorectal cancer, the challenge is that uh, is one of compliance. We actually have a very good screen. The colonoscopy is highly accurate at about 95% accuracy. Um, the problem is, is compliance. People don't like that particular screen. And so many Americans, many Canadians, many people globally just refuse to get screened for this cancer type. We will uh, largely solve that compliance problem if we can introduce an accurate blood test as an alternative, for instance, to a colonoscopy. Many, many, many more people would do a blood test for colorectal cancer who would say no to a colonoscopy. So we could get more people screened at uh, overall get people screened at a younger age uh, because they wouldn't delay a blood test as much as they might delay or refuse a colonoscopy. We can catch these cancers, this, these colorectal cancers at earlier stages, treat them before they've spread or progressed to a later stage, and obviously save lives and improve outcomes. And then with lung cancer, and then I'll uh, wrap up and open it up to some questions, but with lung cancer, uh, the different challenge, the, the challenge that doctors have is um, the primary screen is, is often a, a low dose computed tomography or a CAT scan of the lungs. And the doctors have to interpret the CAT scan, determine whether or not what they're seeing in the scan, the nodules that they're looking at are malignant or benign, and then decide whether or not to order a lung biopsy, which is a surgical procedure to take a tissue sample or samples from a person's lung or lungs. And about 15% of the time that causes a collapsed lung in the patient. So being able to run a volition blood test after the CAT scan to help inform the doctor and the patient whether or not to proceed to lung biopsy and the risks associated with that, or not to proceed with lung biopsy and to monitor the patient for a period of time, which also has risks, right? If, if the patient does have lung cancer and it isn't confirmed to a lung biopsy and they're sent home for another scan in six months or 12 months, there's a potential that that lung cancer could be progressing to a later stage and or metastasizing. So. Uh, being able to position a blood test as sort of that gatekeeper between the CAT scan and a lung biopsy would be a very critical tool and very useful piece of information in deciding whether or not that patient should have the lung biopsy. So you can see we have a number of programs in human health. Uh, we've, we've launched a commercial product in animal health. Really excited about the opportunities both in human and animal health. And I will just wrap up by pointing you to our financial snapshot slide. Uh, our ticker symbol VNRX, we're listed on the NYSE American Stock Exchange market cap, has been in between the 150 to 200 million dollar market cap range. Uh, we finished the end of Q1 with 33 million in cash. Five analysts cover the company: uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, uh, Zacks, Benchmark, Aegis, uh, and Maxim Group. Strong insider ownership, management team on the board. We own about 18 percent of the shares. Institutions have about 30, 35% of the shares. Strong cash position given our burn. Um, and uh, hope all of you will continue to follow the Volition story. Our website is volition.com. And uh, we have a number of um, developments coming over the course of the year as it relates to our programs in human health and oncology, and as it relates to our animal health product. So again, thank you all for uh, listening to my presentation today and uh, happy to turn it over to Gilbert to see if there are any questions. Thank you all. Okay, so Scott here, uh, a few questions here. The first one coming from Franco. It's asking for you, uh, NeoCoFet products, what sort of revenue figures are you forecasting in the next 12 months at all? Oh, that's a great question. And our, analyst, our analysts ask us all the time, it's very, very difficult to predict revenue from the VET product because it's, it's, a, it's a new product. So we, we did what we're calling sort of a beta launch or a soft launch in November, where we didn't do any national advertising. We didn't, do, we, we didn't take out ads in TV or in the, in the paper or anything like that um, because we want to get feedback from the vets, find out what they like about the test, what they don't like, get the packaging um, finished, make sure the supply chain works. Um, 
we're, we're pretty much done with the beta launch. Now we're going to move into a full scale nationwide launch over the next coming months where we're going to advertise on social media. We may take advertising out on TV, radio, um, internet, etc. We've also announced publicly that we're in um, discussions with a number of large animal health diagnostics companies about a potential licensing deal for our product. So it's, it's really hard to say. Our, I think our total addressable market of the 77 million canines, given that our blood test screens for two common canine cancer types and given we can position as an asymptomatic screen and a symptomatic screen, I think our total market is about 10 to 15 million canines of those 77 million at a four, at $45 revenue to us. Um, now, if we sign a licensing deal, that could result in a large upfront payment to Volition potentially, and that could really expand that total addressable market because they may find other uses for our tests like therapy monitoring, treatment selection, and it could penetrate the international market. So uh, that total addressable market could increase substantially, but we have not given public guidance, but you know, it's, 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 a, it's a very significant opportunity for us both domestically and internationally. Okay, the next question from Morgan and is asking, why are you doing a beta launch of the new Cuvette in Texas? Are you, do you have special grants in the government over there, in that state? We do not, but we have a relationship with Texas A&M University. So in 2019, we granted Texas A&M University a 12.5% equity ownership stake in our wholly owned subsidiary. So in return, so, so they're an equity owner of our subsidiary. And in return, they ran the clinical studies and they launched the test for us. Um, right now, it's just being sold on their website. Once we move from beta to a national launch, they don't, there's not an exclusive with them, but they're in, they benefit if there are multiple sales channels, right? If, if we sign a deal with a large animal health company, um, that would be more revenue to volition. That would mean, I would hope that our share price would increase. That would mean their 12 and a half percent equity stake would be worth more than it was two years ago. Um, so that's the relationship there. We will you know, proceed with this nationwide launch over the next couple of months. And the next one coming from Ryan here in, the, in this side, and it's asking what's your current burn rate again? About 2 million per month. We have 33 million in cash at the end of Q1. Um, we'll, so the burn will be off. So that's, a, that's enough cash to say the end of 2022. We can offset that with revenue from vet sales any kind of a licensing deal that we were to sell. We also have an at-the-market, an ATM facility with Cancer Fitzgerald, so we're opportunistically selling shares from the ATM facility. And we, we often get grants and loans from the Walloon region of Belgium where we're a significant employer. So this question from Mark here, how close do you think you can uh, nationalizing the vet product, so make it national? Some of the partners that we're talking to have uh, distribution outside the U.S. in, in Canada, so it, it's it's possible that we would be able to penetrate. I think the the most logical markets are Canada and Europe because there tends to be, um, you know, high percentages of of, uh, of canine ownership in, in those regions. So this one from James, uh, can you provide details on how do you, um, your sales and distribution strategy? for veterinarians uh, or other end users? Yeah, so Texas A&M has uh, been advertising email and on their student newsletter to all the vets that have graduated from their veterinary college. So we're building awareness through A&M. A&M has seven other sister schools and colleges. So we'll be, they'll be going out to these other seven schools that have vets to notify their veterinarian community of the, of the test. Then once we do the nationwide launch, we'll do marketing through social media and, and national advertising channels, most likely. Great, I think uh, that's uh, uh, conclude all the uh, questions and answers uh, period for us. Uh, indeed, thank you all for your time here, Scott. Thank you, Gilbert. Thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon.